Lasso you guys and get you with it. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do a few tips here, and uh, we're gonna talk. This. this is automatic transmission day, and what we got here, this is a five R. Oh yeah, five R eleven five R one ten W. Is that how you say it? Uh, transmission that like you see in your Ford Super Duty and Excursion. Uh, delayed engagement in the drive. Now this is. Uh, to also be accompanied by a shutter on takeoff, and it's not normal driving conditions, but it's a common problem. So it happens on some of these trucks. And so it occurred enough times that the ATSG produced a bulletin about it in 2008, uh, and that recommended using solid endless style Teflon rings like you use on a 4L60E pump stator support for the forward clutch drum instead of the five of uh, the step cut rings that that drum uses. Now the step cut rings. You know those little steel rings that's, that's cut on the ends where you got to lock them together? And then, like y'all may have seen them when you do the transmission work. So they were talking about doing away with those and putting the Teflon rings on there. Now the thing about the Teflon rings, a lot of times whenever you spread them and put them over there, some of them are cut so that you can put them in there really easy and they got a slant cut, you know. Some of them you got to stretch them over there and put them in the groove and then resize them back down with the, with the tool, you know. So, I mean, I really never liked those, but they apparently seal better. So... The bulletin first says to check and verify line pressure. The line pressure and line rise problems may indicate a faulty pressure control solenoid, a sticking pressure regulator valve, boost valve, bad filter, which might be aftermarket, faulty oil pump. You gotta look at the forward clutch housing and inspect the molded piston in the seal ring area in the center support. Uh, now, those clutches right there, obviously, look at them, they don't look all that bad, really. Uh, in this particular, you know, whenever that, that piston in the bottom of that thing comes up and and bites the uh, clutches. That's what gives you, you got teeth on the inside of these clutches, teeth on the outside of those, and that's what marries the two components together that, are, that are, uh, those clutches are operating with. Um, the first automatic transmission I ever took apart was in 1979, and this guy that walked by there that had done transmissions went in there and took the inside seal out of one of the uh, clutch pistons and was looking at it and says, oh, look at this, this is not any good. Well, since I didn't take it out, I didn't think to put it back. And when I put it together, it would engage just fine until the fluid got hot. And then it would start bypassing the place where that missing seal was, and it wouldn't pull, so I had to pull it back out of there. Uh, but anyway, uh, you got to be, uh, a lot of the times when you got two people working on something, you know, everybody thought the other person did it. You know, we've had problems in here like that. If I thought you tightened that, well, I thought you tightened it, and now it didn't get tightened, and now we got a big issue. It's good to check behind each other, you know, and make sure. Um, all right, if everything else is ruled out, but the solid ring zone uh, could remedy the problem. So checking the clutch with compressed air while the drum's on the center support can confirm the need for the rings when it reveals excessive leaking in this area. Now checking with compressed air is really pretty, you gotta be creative and you gotta have a blower that you fixed up so that you can go in there where the fluid goes in. You gotta feel like where the, where does the fluid go in there to apply that piston, you gotta get in there with a rubber tip if possible, and you gotta shoot some air pressure in there and see if it goes thump, 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 and it applies. They've also got uh, the plate that you bolt on the bottom of the transmission and it's marked to tell you, you know, whenever you put air in this hole, this one, and this one, it's applying various different stuff. I got some plates up there, but those plates, the plate I got for the, the uh, 4R70W transmission costs like $220 or something. It's not, they're not cheap. Uh, and you bolt them on there just like you would the valve body, and then you put air into various places, and if it goes thump, 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 if you come to one, it goes psh, then you know you got issues with that particular one. Now, here was a case study of a 2008 F450 Power Stroke diesel, and the transmission would engage drive without the delay, but would slip on takeoff just above idle and get worse with heavier throttle. That's a kind of a war story thing. Uh, even though it slipped on a little light throttle, it pulled well enough for the owner to drive it in for repair. So, he jerks the transmission out, he tears it down, expecting to find the forward clutches toasted, but they weren't all that bad. I mean, they was a little slippage, really you can see there, but it wasn't that bad. It wasn't bad enough to explain what was going on. So he cleans everything up, puts in new parts, air checked the drum, and everything seemed fine. So he said he's done his homework, he's, he's putting his all in here. Once in the vehicle, the problem was still there. Line pressure was checked, verified to be working properly. Then he pulled the unit out again and put the Teflon rings on a forward drum, which is what that's talking about. The air check was a lot better after he put the Teflon rings on there, so he thought the problem was resolved. He pulled it out again because he still had the problem. 
Now, I was telling some of you guys the other day, this one of the transmission shop in Nothan where I'm at, <coughs> parts, I was talking about one day when we were arguing about a transmission that we were fighting with here. And the guy was talking to his mechanic, you know, that worked with him over there. And he says, you know, that's like that CD4E that we pulled out about 10 times. <laughs> you know, so even professional transmission mechanics have trouble with them sometimes. Even some of your more simple transmissions will smack you around a little bit now and again. Um, but uh, if he looked at it closer, and he found a crack just below the direct clutch up area of the forward drum. And that's what he's pointing at with his little pointer here. There was a crack there. You could, couldn't even really see it unless you were really, really looking close. And that crack would open up when it was under load, uh, and it would drop forward clutch apply pressure. And on the bench, it checked nicely with compressed air. But the, when it was under a load, it would open that crack more. And so you'd wind up with a situation like that. All right? And uh, or, uh, who is this? OK. Let me see what the parts guy think. Hello, parts person. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Quit. Quincy? Quincy Thomas? Or, oh, you mean the guy that runs the diesel shop? That's Eddie. Yeah. Well, you're going to probably you're going to come over here and tell him about it because he never answers his phone. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, anyway, she's got some Rotella on sale. If anybody needs any Rotella oil, she's got it on sale over there at the park store. Okay. All right. So. This one right here is a different one. 2010 Volkswagen CC2 gear. Dual clutch direct shift gear. What's that about? Why do you need two clutches? What do you see that's peculiar about that automatic transmission? That is an automatic transmission. What looks peculiar about it? What catches your eye about this, guys? It looks like a manual transmission, doesn't it? It's got gears. It's basically a transmission with gears in it instead of clutches and stuff. All right. So, but it does have two clutches in the front. You got two input shafts and two clutches, and it synchronizes the shifts. It does it automatically. So you take off, you put it in go, and it shifts through. And Ford's got a one. I think they put it in one of the little C Max or something like this. But this particular one was in a Volkswagen direct shift gearbox or twin clutch transmission. It's an automated transmission that can change gears faster than any other geared transmission. It can speed shift like nobody's business for you, right? And dual clutch transmissions deliver more power and better control than traditional automatic transmission and faster performance than a manual transmission. So it's really a pretty good idea if they can get the bugs worked out and get it working right. However, it requires some cooling. And this one here was intermittently throwing this up here on the dash. Transmission overheated. Stop! Owner's manual. All right. Now, on this particular transmission, there's a heat exchanger. There's an oil pressure filter. And so basically, the heat exchanger is a possible maybe on that. So when usually when you take the transmission out, you leave the heat exchanger there with the water hoses hooked to it. Now, basically, you're going to have coolant hoses hooked to it, and it's going to take the, uh, kind of like a, what's in a radiator, it's going to run the transmission fluid through the coolant exchanger and let the coolant take the heat out of the transmission fluid. Well, they just fix it so it pumps it through the radiator like all night transmission. Well, they chose not to do that for some reason, probably because they didn't want that. The radiator was too little or something like that. This is a small car, okay? I, don't, I mean, personally, it seems to me like they would have been better off to put it in the air. But for whatever reason, they decided to do this. Well, usually when you do it, the, heat, the transmission remains with the car. All right, and inside the transmission, you got a suction filter that looks like an automatic transmission filter. You notice that? That's pretty cool stuff. All right, this right here, fluid's routed through the heat exchanger. Can you find me the heat exchanger on that schematic up there? Somebody find it for me. An external cord. Very good. That wasn't too hard to read, was it? And uh, you know, of course, it's got those lines in there that you know sprays it around in there. And then you got your sump and your internal filter. And that is basically this is a schematic of what's actually in there. Uh, you got a little damper piston there, cooling pressure solenoid, and it's basically got some little electronic, uh, driven, electronically driven forks that do your shifting for you. But it has to, you know, release one sh uh, clutch while the other one is still engaged, and then, you know, to synchronize the shifts and all. Okay, so once that passes through the filter, have anybody ever heard of, seen a uh, driven a uh, Volkswagen Bug that had a stick shift automatic? 
you had to shift the gears, but it didn't have a clutch. And when you put your hand on the gear shifter, it would release the clutch. It had a torque converter, but it had a little clutch back there with a vacuum motor pulling it. And it, only, it was only a three-speed. It had, you know, it had you know, three forward gears, one reverse gear. And I had one of them things. I didn't like it. But it just had a, you know, instead of a clutch in the floorboard, it just had a brake pedal down there. And so when you put your hand on it and you put it in gear, as long as you had your hand on it, it wasn't pulling. But when you let go of the gear shifter, it would and then you take off. And then when you put your hand on the gear shifter, it release that little clutch back there with that vacuum motor. And you just shift it without matching a clutch. Why well, when you want to stop? When you put your foot on the brake and you stop. And you put it in neutral. Well, I would say yeah. But yeah, it wasn't going to go to neutral ISL. You had to put it well, in. Well, I didn't know if yeah. it was like an automatic transmission. No, it wasn't. Uh, it was a. It's what you call a stick shift automatic. The only thing that meant was you could you could shift it without using a clutch. You know, of course, anybody that's, that's played around with it, driving a manual transmission you can usually shift it without a clutch, too, if you don't play with it. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, the fluid is routed through the heat exchanger for coolant and then through the oil pressure filter. Once it passes through the filter, it's routed to an oil spray pipe for a gas. <laughs> <laughs> giant fucking spray. Yeah, I that with a giant spatter invasion you had going on. Holy there. crap. Yeah, you can put black walnuts uh, around the doors, and it's toxic, toxic to spiders, and they won't come in. That's what I heard. Yeah, it's huge. I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, the oil spray, sorry about that. I did not plan that spot for that spot. They're still trying to walk away. They need to kill him. All right. So, rather than oil spray pop for a shaft and gear lubrication. Okay, that's what the filter looks like. See that? You like the filter? Is this a good filter here? That's a mess, isn't it? Okay, the heat exchanger was going to be removed for the transmission, but what they happened, that entailed disconnecting the water lines. And they're going to remove the oil pressure filter, but it was loaded with dirty fluid. And the filter material was deteriorated, and that's why I was overheating. So, you people that's ignoring the filter is not a good plan, is it? Right? That particular filter right there. Okay, so there's a TSB from Volkswagen, another one, concerning an implausible transmission shift sequence DTC 2711 stored TCM, uh, 2014 National 3. That will be accompanied by shifting concern and or a no engagement when in drive reverse. And debris in the clutch assembly, see this, and this is the same, you know, deal, same down there. See all them clutches? Got this little clutch thing going on there? That's what's up with that. Uh, causing too much drag torque from the multiple clutch. Explains if this is the only coach stored with vehicle having over 19,000 miles of dual clutch drill assembly and uh, cover will need to be replaced. And you can see what it looks like right there. Okay, there's not a lot of causes to consider. When you fight with that, you can read the words as good as I can, one possible reason. Can be related to pump cavitation. Nope. Tell me, tell me what pump cavitation is. I mean, why does it, what's, what's causing it? Well, usually because the fluid Something happened back there. But. Yeah, usually because like, say you're on like your filler, somebody don't put the O-ring on it, and then it's, the fluid's below it, you know, and then it's soaking air. Yeah, that's a that's like a yeah, that's some foam stuff. Also, another thing it can cause with pump cavitation. Anything that's keeping the pump from getting the fluid that it needs can cause it. You see it on fuel pump. Or you can also have a situation where you've got little cavities that develop in the reaction surfaces instead of them being smooth anymore. So there's several different ways you can describe that. You know, it's got to do with bubbles and cavities and that kind of thing. But if it's not able to move fluid in a smooth fashion, you know. Uh, you got issues with that. That, go, that goes for water pumps too, by the way. Uh, the fluid becomes aerated, it rises up and blows out the uh, vent or the fuel tube. Now that's what we're talking about blowing fluid. You know, I talked the other day uh, about my, my son was driving an uh, 84 uh, Grand Mar a little marquee that I bought. And uh, it was blowing transmission fluid, would just start coming out and blowing out behind the car. It was just coming out the vent and the transmission. And uh, we put a modulator, <coughs> modulator valve on it. And a transmission, change the fluid, put a modulator valve on it, and put a transmission cooler in front of the radiator of one of them uh, that just is in the air, and that took care of that. Uh, but if that's fairly common, whenever a bunch of crud gets piling up in the radiator to where it doesn't allow the fluid to get cooled properly, you can replace the radiator if you want to, but we don't want to do that. So anyway, we didn't spend all that much money doing it the way we did it. But uh, we're talking here basically about transmission blowing fluid out. Uh, you can also have an overfill transmission if you put too much fluid in there. Like, let's see, who's the last person I can think of that put too much fluid in the transmission? 
look at all those fingers pointing around. Oh my goodness. You know. Well, I mean, he really hadn't been trained on transmissions yet. And so what he did was, all of the fluid that he got, he just basically said, well, I've got seven quarts of fluid. I'm going to pour seven quarts of fluid in there. Well, it didn't even five. And so he just kept going pour, 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 and it was basically this far up the stick, and you know, <laughs> but it will puke out if it does that. Except, except, did you guys see the little handout I gave you about filling the transmission fluid on one of those little three two forties? Yeah, yeah. So, it'll make it hunker down if it's got too much fluid in it. A lot of people don't. It won't. That one doesn't push it out the vent, huh? What car is that? That's a little like a '99 uh, Malibu. Was that that lady that you said took her car where it couldn't get it fixed and brought it here? It was, we drained the fluid out and it fixed it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we drained a couple of quarters. Matt, my son drove one of those cars. He took it to get an oil change. Somebody poured a bunch of fluid in the transmission it didn't need. And when he drove it away from there, it wouldn't hardly go. But you're saying, I think you were saying that the problem with that, or that the problem with that, but most other transmissions have a bit like it. Yeah, yeah it'll blow out of there. Yeah. You know, it'll blow out of the bed. That's usually what you see. Well, Fleet accounts where the company owns vans or trucks are the same manufacturer but different engine sizes and transmissions. They think they have enough much oil goes in there, but they do. Now U-Hauls always have, typically the U-Haul vehicle I've seen have got a drain plug on the transmission. And some vehicles have drain plugs on the transmission, some don't. But they change the transmission fluid after every time they rent it if it's been pulling a trailer. Because the fluid gets dark and ugly and starts to cause valves to stick if they don't, so they just change it. They just pop the plug out and change the transmission fluid like you would engine oil on those. So, but anyway, like every couple times or every time. I guess I don't know. I never worked at U-Haul, but I know they have them. Uh, the U-Haul trucks have got, you know, the ones I've seen have got a drain plug on the transmission. Now that GMC does, and some of your foreign cars do, and all that. But uh, the torque converter. Listen to this now. Uh, malfunctioning torque converter, which is where the heat comes from in a transmission. Uh, can have the problem that we're converter clutch problem hydraulic circuit the converter converter clutch now on the motor homes that I worked on the great big motor homes that, that basically uh, would you know the huge 10,000 pound things that you see people driving around um, the torque converter clutch engages on those at 22 miles an hour that's the strategy that they got built into that uh, control on that and uh, basically whenever they engage the torque converter clutch uh, what, did, what happened? Why is it that engaging a torque converter clutch makes a difference in temperature, you think? Will it get hot quicker if you engage a torque converter clutch or, or not as quick? Not as quick because it wouldn't be as much slippage. Yeah, you're, well, you're not going to have, you're not going to be always shearing fluid, so it's not going to build it up, it's not going to heat it up as quick. You know, so they're basically they're concerned about a, a lot of fluid shear on those, apparently. So anyway, uh, I found that out working on the normal motor home. We was riding, I was riding with this couple one time that was an old, you know, people a lot of times would ride with them. When you get in those motor homes, they always smell like a dog because they always got a dog with them, you know. So we'd get in there and we'd drive around and I would be trying to troubleshoot a problem. And we'd pull back in and around where the body shop was. And there was all these <coughs> smashed up cars out there. They got a high volume body shop over at Bundy's. And when I pulled back in there, one of those, uh, they were from up north. And one of them says, what's all these smashed up cars around here? And I said, this is the cars I smashed up driving motor homes. <laughs> anyway, they knew I was just kidding. So, one of the motor, the filter and main pressure line control can, can be a contributing factor. If main line pressure remains really high, that's going to restrict or shut off converter flow and generate high temperatures rapidly because it won't, you know, go ahead and lock up. Uh, cooler bypass valves are another possibility. What in the world would need a cooler bypass valve for? Why do we need a cooler bypass valve? In case the cooler starts. Uh, yeah, we want it to bypass. We don't want it to not be able to get any fluid anywhere, right? We want it to still be able to go. Uh, these can be located on the transmission, somewhere in the cooling line between the transmission and the radiator, or they can be in the radiator itself. And when they malfunction, they prevent the transmission fluid from being cooled by the heat exchanger. Also, the 80 metal Ford pickup that I had, when I parked it, it was slightly uphill. I like to park a pickup truck. If I got a pickup, I park it slightly uphill if it's going to be sitting there a lot, because when it rains, I want the water to run out of the bed, right? I don't want it to puddle up in the front. So what I did, I parked it like that. When I cranked that 80 model F-150 up that I used to have, it had a C6 transmission in it, it would uh, sit there and I'd have to run it for a minute or two before it would get pressure and dunk. And what would happen was, when you shut it off, uh, and it was slightly on an uphill, it would siphon all the fluid out of the torque converter, and it had to fill the torque converter up before it would move. That was a morning sickness thing, as they called it. But anyway, what I would do is I would take the, I mean, what they do is they take a little uh, one-way valve and put in the uh, lines going to the, from the cooler. Now, when the, when the transmission cooler, when the fluid leaves the transmission 
it's leaving the torque converter, and when it comes back to the transmission after it's gone to the cooler, it goes back into the pan, right? And so that's basically how that does. Uh, but anyway, this is another thing you got right here. Radiators and heat exchangers can be another cause for transmission overheating if the cooler flow itself was restricted where it couldn't pass through the radiator or the heat exchanger. You know, if you got hoses that are pinched or something like that, that would negatively affect the loop causing catastrophic failure too. So another issue uh, is the if cooler flow is perfect, that's the draw there. The coolant passages, though, instead of restricted for preventing the coolant from extracting the heat from the transmission fluid. You can have all kinds of stuff externally clogged up about a transmission cooler if it's one of those kind, that can make it not happen. And so there's a lot of stuff uh, that's from uh, the finer points. Like, see, you can read that right there. Uh, this one example, Mitsubishi had problems with their Montero overheating when under heavy load. They provided an expanded capacity uh, automatic transmission oil pan kit to resolve this issue. And it had an expanded pan, a larger oil filter, and a length and dipstick. Have you ever seen a transmission oil pan with cooler fins on it? Sometimes you'll see those. Then you had uh, the sump would run low. What's the sump? Suction pump. Reservoir. Huh? Huh? Reservoir. Reservoir. Yeah, that's the place where the pump gets his oil, right? But it's in the pan, right? Uh, but if it runs low on coolant, I mean, it runs low on not coolant, but transmission fluid, you got to use there. Uh, that is a comprehensive list. It's going to be really, really hard to make on that. But overheating transmissions can be something that can beat you up if you're not thinking clearly all the way through. And you can have a new cooler, and you can have new this, and you can have clear lines and good flow and all that kind of stuff, and still have problems because of your torque converter or whatever. That's the point about all that. Okay, so that pretty well is... Uh, Handling this, you're going to have your uh, uh, car ready to drive this afternoon. All right, then. If you can keep working on it, huh?